I should have sound. That's what the sound's there for. Okay, Jules Verne, born 1828 to 1905. Uh, in 1870, he writes the original French version of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, which is an amazing book. And then in somewhere in the 1870s, there was this horrible English translation that dropped a third of the text and admitted key details like that he was an Indian who wore a turban, which is why he doesn't in the film. And then in 1989, there was a, a totally redone English translation that's, uh, that's the one you want to pick up and look for. Okay, so uh, Disney, Walt Disney was absolutely obsessed with the book and the story and he wanted to do something with it for a long time and so in 1952 he sinks everything he's got into this film, the 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea movie. Uh, it goes into theaters in 1952, it comes out in theaters again in 1963 and again in 1971. That's what they did back then before we had videos. And I particularly enjoy the West German poster, especially for that it looks like Nemo's kind of like standing on Kirk Douglas's shoulder here. And also for the comparison with the East German poster, which like make what you will of what that's <laughs> that says of our German friends. Okay, so in 1959, this, you know, there's a lot of confusion around the 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea Ride. And a lot of it comes from the, in 1959, in Disneyland, so we're in California, they open the submarine voyage, which Disney had wanted to make as a 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea Ride, but they got a sponsor that was actually a, a nuclear submarine manufacturer, and they were like, we want the models, we want the submarines to look like our submarines. So that had a big impact on why it looks this way. And then after Disneyland was such a huge success, in 1971, in Disney World, he was able to make it the way he wanted to make it. And you can see the, po um, but it's very much a reskinning of the same ride, and it's, it's not surprising that people who've been on one or both often get pretty confused about which one uh, they were on. Uh, particularly, like, even like, look at the posters. It's just change the sub, take out some mermaids. <laughs> so, I only rode this ride once when I was three. Um, I don't even know how I remember anything about it, but like I do remember bubbles. I remember a porthole, like some kind of porthole. I remember bubbles, and I remember, oh my God, there's a giant squid eating that submarine. And, and I remember the nightmares, years and years <laughs> of nightmares. So, but now I can tell you a lot more about how this thing worked and uh, what was going on when people got on the ride. This is a nice view from the uh, Skyway, which was like the you know, tram thing that went over the top. So, uh, if you can make this out, there was actually a concrete track that the submarines ran on. They were free floating and that they were actually ships and floating in the water, but they had like guide rails that took them through this. And then on either side, as you went ar along, would be the dioramas, which also means that like, yes, there's, there's two of everything so that the people on either side can see all the attractions. And of course, they didn't actually submerge. Uh, there were just these sort of bubble generators that made the effect, but at least one person had a panic attack on every single sub full of people because they just, the effect somehow was convincing enough, even though like all you had to do was go like that and you could just see the surface. But uh, they really went all out on the presentation. I think in some ways the, what you saw above ground was as impressive as what you saw under and it's sort of a great example of how Disney was so obsessed with presentation and how much it meant. I mean, you get the right angle and the fog swirling on the right day and it just, it's right out of the movie. It's this postcard image, it's freaking amazing. The details, all the rivets, this is all fiberglass, but it's still, and you know, you've got your crew members are fully decked out in costumes that are sort of, that are very close to the films. And you know, another nice touch is up here in the sail, you can actually see the pilot through the bubbles there. Um, and so, without further ado, this is a, very cut down version of what was about a 20 minute ride that I've sort of compiled so for those of you who weren't there can get a sense of it and those who did ride on it can uh, get ready for a nostalgic flashback. <laughs> Weather alert, all controls 80 degrees down. 
And now we're going into the dark area of the ride. For ages, these rotting holes have kept their secret treasures safeguarded by silent sentinels of the deep. Man eating sharks. Classic ruins could very well be the legendary Lost Continent of Atlantis. And the concept of Atlantis is pure. Now this part wasn't in the world. with legends of sea serpents and mermaids. Definitely hold over to the California attraction. It's one of ours. Its hull has been crushed like an eggshell. The repellent shark! Surface! 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 20,000 leagues under the sea. Look, we'll put you in just a minute. And so from getting on the line to the end of that, that was probably about two hours of your, out of your day for uh, the e-ticket attraction. Okay, amazing 20K facts. This is an aerial shot. You can make out, there's the external part, and this whole warehouse area is the, um, the dark portion of the ride. There were 12 full submarines, usually a nine in operation at any one time, and this is a dry dock back here where they could store them and repair them. Um, Again, a reminder that it's crazy that there's two of everything on both sides of the track all the way through there. Um, we've got 11.5 million gallons of water here. And the thing that's even crazier about that is this is 25% of the real estate in Fantasyland. And still, it's only one third of the, the size of the original plan. Um, I think one of the Imagineers was just like, well, we just, you, you can't, like the gods won't allow. <laughs> so it was definitely an engineering feat of, a, of an amazing proportion. Okay, so behind the scenes at 20K, let's get some fun stuff from some people who actually worked on this ride. Um, this is the, what the control room actually looked like. I got all this stuff from connecting with people who actually worked on the ride, and my friend Bert drew up a little uh, diagram here so you could actually learn to drive one of these things if they were around anymore. Um, this is, these are the catwalks that are above the dark portion of the ride for, uh, you know, evacuating people if, if need be, if something goes wrong. Uh, apparently there were some really wild parties on these catwalks after hours and uh, a lot of beer bottles and condoms were often found strewn about. Um, so they actually had a full dive locker underneath the pool, uh, underneath the water area and um, so they would have divers that would go in to repair the animatronics that were constantly breaking um, due to heavy use and the sun just on them. Um, I this, is, this video is actually from the, the Disneyland attraction, but I, I just love it too much to not show this little clip. I love a guy getting suited up to jump in and then just stand up. <laughs> and then the, and then how, about, how about this lobster? Okay, and this is a fun little back scene. This is a checklist for the repair guys of like each of the motors. This is sheet one of two of the different attractions, what pieces move. And you definitely get a sense that over time as the, it just, the ride got just worn down, like that they would just be like, you know, turtle, still attached, check, next. <laughs> uh, but they did twice during its history, they had, they did a huge, they drained the thing and did a huge refurbish, which, it's really fun to see the photos of this because you can see how colorful it actually was, which doesn't really come through from above. And you could see it when you were on the ride in a way. This is like when it's freshly painted. And they would go around and replace all this um, plastic seaweed. And there was actually someone talked to me whose job it was to make sure that no one was like spelling their name or a swear word in seaweed as it was being placed. Um, <laughs> All right, so the subs themselves were quite a feat as well. Each of these beasts weighed 40 tons, uh, was 40 feet long, held 38 passengers, uh, was in fact completely seaworthy. If you put this thing in the ocean, it was made by a boat manufacturer. If you put this thing in an ocean, it would just go. It would be fine, uh, except that you can't steer. Um, but, it, they, <laughs> but they are driven by a propeller, diesel engine, all that stuff. Uh, eight track audio system, top of the line, which was later replaced with CDs. Um, this is uh, some the schematics blueprints for the thing here. These are nice because you can see the guide track thing that goes underneath, which also served as the bumper. So you can see these, they couldn't actually collide with each other, thankfully, because that would have been a nightmare. But the, these bumpers would hit, and there definitely were instances where if they hit enough, one could jump out of the track, and that would be a real mess to clean up. 
All right, this is Bob Gurr, who's a, fam a famous Imagineer who's very known for cooperating with all sorts of Disney fan nuts. Uh, this was a prototype control mechanism that didn't make it in that he took this photo for me. What is, I mean, he's such a sweetheart. And that's Bob Gurr on the day when the first one of these rolled out of the factory about to christen it. Um, and here's, uh, I can't remember this guy's name, but he was the head of this boatyard that built them. I love that they just kind of rolled them. How else are you gonna move? <laughs> How else are you gonna get this thing there? Um, and then this, I love this shot because you get a sense of the detail that goes into everything that was down underneath the water there. The gold plating, the, the uh, Atlantis statue. These, they actually printed these fiberglass coins in the, in that were just sort of strewn about everywhere. Um, I love that though later on when they, when those were like just disappearing and just like corroding to nothing, they would use Mardi Gras coins and just like dump them, <laughs> dump them in. All right, so the life of a 20 ker This was one of the only attractions, in fact, I believe the only attraction at Disney World that was exclusively male cast. There was, uh, for one year in, I believe, the early 80s, there was a, some people got pissed about that, which uh, understandably, reasonably, and uh, a woman was on the crew for like, three days and she was like, get me the heck out of here. Like <laughs> this. Um, so originally they had these beautiful pewter hat pins, which these days are very rare because they just would disappear because they were like too nice of a thing. And then later on, you would just have these uh, sewn ones. Um, this is uh, Bert, the fellow who drew that sketch for me. He was such a nerd even at the time that this is him. He posed for the photographs for the like hand signal manual because they did have radios, but they, so this is like coming into dock. Or, uh, okay, Bert. And, oh, sorry, break time. My God, I've not been studying. Um, and he also earned the, himself the nickname Bass for like commenting one too many times that the bass was broken and they, and so, but these were actually a bunch of kids. And so it, was, it's, it seems like from the stories I hear that it was a really fun place to work and there were a lot of pranks that they could play on each other. Um, they made these uh, membership cards. Uh, I'll, draw, I'll draw your attention to this line, specializing in 914 pursuit. Um, 914 was the radio code for a hot girl. <laughs> and so, and uh, 913 was the code for a girl too young to be of interest. And so apparently you would often hear something like, uh, like we got a 914, we got a 914 on the rear spur to uh, uh, can't negative that, 913, 913. <laughs> They also had a very intense rivalry going with the uh, Jungle Cruise crew, and this was like, they would always have contests and mock each other up. Okay, so, 1994. What's wrong with this picture? The water, it's too still. One day out of nowhere, they're just like, oh, we're sh the ride's off today for maintenance. Um, and it, they'd said like, oh, we're just gonna repair it, and then, but things got a little more ominous, like people were like, wait, where does, there's no subs out here anymore. Um, and then King Triton, 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 just appeared and they're like, oh my God, Ariel's Little Mermaid's taken over. Um, and then the, 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 where you would wait in line to get into the 20,000 Leagues on the Sea Ride became like a get your picture taken with Ariel thing, uh, which all felt very temporary, to be honest. So there was still some hope that what was, what was this gonna be about? And in 2004, Triton disappeared and this green wall went up all around. And uh, on the inside, they drained it, and everything was, everything was dead. Um, and what you're about to see is a miracle, um, that someone did this. There was a fellow on the demolition crew who knew of the website where I got all the, where I, that I made, where I connected with all this stuff. And um, this fellow walked the tracks of the drained ride and took all these photographs you're about to see. And, and the whole time, so this, I'd had the site up for several years at this point, and we all wondered, like, did they gut everything? Did they throw the squid out? Was that all just trashed? Or was it all sitting there in the water, rotting and being like the creepiest urban ruin in the universe? Um, which, in fact, it was. And so there's like the Viking ship. It's, it's weird how the scale when you get a, a, a perspective to see it, it's very, it's like the water made things seem so big, but like the sunken ships, there they are. There's now look like all the gold, like com, you know, completely eaten off by the chlorine. Um, and you can see like the walkways and the lighting. 
Oh, I love his stuff. And yes, there he is. <laughs> Better days, my friends. <laughs> Better days. And, and this is amazing. Both giant squids, human in there for scale. Um, and the, but the Nautilus that they were holding didn't hold up so well, kind of just crumbled. And uh, this eye is over the couch of a guy I know in Florida who walked out with it. Um, and the Nautilus below him, again, pretty trashed. And then the bulldozers just came in and pretty much trashed everything. Just uh, his head survived and the squid's eyes and you know some people took some stuff, but really it all just got trashed. And outside, the picture really wasn't much prettier. They just started tearing through all the concrete. And uh, in 2005, we have Pooh's Playful Spot. Yay. Yay. Which again feels very temporary. It's so, but there's a, there's a fun detail that if you go to this tree, actually, I don't think this is here anymore. I don't go to Disney World every year. Um, if you go inside the main door and you turn around and look behind your head, there's a knot in the wood where they put a, a Nautilus sub, which is just sort of a nice. So, but when the ride's trashed, what else is out there? All these submarines end up in the, uh, what's called the bone yard. There's this amazing yard out behind Epcot where they just park, you know, the ride, the uh, carts from things. And, you know, we wondered, for, people wondered for a while what would happen to these. A couple of these shots got leaked, which is kind of crazy. And then these portholes started showing up on eBay. Uh, Disney themselves selling them for 135 a pop. This is the one in my bathroom that someone gave me. Um, it, and then all sorts of, you're just like, oh my. It's, I remember seeing these show up and sort of feeling like you're kind of like, I wonder if that person I know is okay. And then it's like, hmm, they're probably not okay if their arm is here. And they're probably not okay if their leg's over there. <laughs> they're just, everything's just getting totally stripped down. Uh, this I love, Disney sold these, this pin that had like two slices of brass from like they sliced up one of the portholes and like just put a little piece in there and sold these for 200 bucks a pop. This, the replacement seaweed shows up on eBay. These diver parts show up on eBay. Some woman contacts me and it's like, do you want to buy the shark for $8,500? And I was like, that's $8,500 for a buck tooth shark? No, no thank you. How about $3,500? No. <laughs> and then pieces of the submarine start showing up around the Disney properties. This was, this kind of cut off top of one of the fiberglass shells was in MGM Studios. This is not that long ago behind Epcot Center. They kept the top fiberglass shell and they roll this out for conventions and stuff sometime. But what's really amazing is this is so, they painted one of them red, I don't know why, and they shipped two of them down to, Disney has their own private Caribbean island called Castaway Cay, and the only way you can go there is if you take a Disney cruise. And one of these has disappeared. No one knows whether it just got swept off in a storm or whatever like that. But one of them is out in the snorkel lagoon, and you can go down there and swim with this. Inexplicably, they stripped a lot of the top textures, like the, uh, the sail they chopped off and the, all the hatches. I guess they didn't want like children diving in there and not being able to get out or something. Um, but, uh, oh, it's like Titanic. And then this, this guy sent a video in. It's very cool. <laughs> saying the Nautilus is here. That's the, where the driver would have stood. That's the, the entrance stairs there. And I love that he stuck his hand in one of the portholes and turned his camera around and took this shot of like the, where those pilot would stand. Um, so, a moment of silence for the best liquid space journey ever. Um, so, a lot of times uh, people ask, why? Why would you, why would Disney ever, why, why would you do such a horrible thing? Um, so, the, the biggest, probably the biggest, truest answer on many levels is that the maintenance was just such a nightmare. This thing was, you know, 30 years on, 20, 30 years on, it was just starting to fall apart. There were leaks going down into the dry lockers underneath, and just the rehab would have really, water is awful. Water is, just destroys everything. Um, the 20K movie theme was getting a little old, you know, like the, the, you can see why they would probably be ready to just use that, you know, a fourth of Fantasyland for a Harry Potter attraction. Um, 
Ovitz, who was the CEO, the CFO at a time, there's a, there's a story that he kind of, there were a bunch of letters that, of outrage about you know, the ride being closed, and so he said, okay, I'm gonna go down there, I'm gonna take a look, I'll see how it is, and I'll decide what we're gonna do about this. And the engineering team really wanted him to get a bad impression, because they just, it was such a thorn in their side. So, you know, as the story goes, they like brought out the worst sub they had, like belching diesel gas, and they, dumped a couple buckets of water in the bottom of it so it looked like it was leaking and they just made the audio skip and he just came out of that being like, okay, this, this can't be salvaged, it's such a mess. Um, and that's <laughs> what I, I don't wanna. So, but 20K lives on in other places. Uh, in Tokyo, you can go to Tokyo Disney Sea. This is a static Nautilus sitting there but they have a really great ride where you ride in these little Nautil pods, and it's not actually underwater. It's just like the bubble. The two, the uh, the porthole has a curved porthole that has two layers, so bubbles go up through it. The effect is okay, but nothing like being underwater. And if you go to Paris, you do this like uh, sort of walk through that's not tremendously exciting. And so this is my bathroom, um, <laughs> which is also sort of the 20k, the 20k museum. And sometimes people ask me, why are you so obsessed with this? <laughs> and you know, I, I, I actually gave, the first time I put this presentation together, I gave some thought to that. And, you know, I realized that, like, I had all these nightmares growing up and about where I was, like, floating in this ride at night. And I knew the robots were down there, but they weren't on. And why was that freaking me out so much? And, and it just made me think that, A, I think it means a lot that I never saw it again. I think if I could have gone back when I was 12, I would have been like, this is crap. This is, like, not scary at all, man. Um, and. So I rediscovered it in my late 20s and totally by accident and had this, this most amazing nostalgia r rush of my life. But then I also thought, you know, I think if you're exposed to things at a certain age, they stick in your head in a way that it's like, have you ever tried to show someone these movies who didn't see them when they were under the age of 13? They're like, this, this, is like, this movie's terrible. Um, and another factor that I think all of these movies have is that there was some aspect, some part of them that scared the crap out of you as a small child. And so I think that's really integral to uh, what sort of, the, the element of fear going all the way back to you know Grimm, and I think Tim Burton's really got his thumb on that pulse. Um, so, and this is like my favorite photo I've ever found. I just, just imagine like three-year-old me being like dunked in that water and you have, many a nightmare for myself. And this was a beautiful light at the Tokyo attraction, so I thought I'd leave you with that. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we'll take a, a couple of questions really fast if you have any, but I, I wanna make uh, two comments first. So I, I think the nostalgia piece is actually really important. Uh, just in October, November, my wife made me watch, which I had somehow never seen my entire life, uh, The NeverEnding Story for the first time. Bad, yeah, bad idea. I got like eight bad minutes idea. into it, and I was like, this is just the most unwatchable thing I've ever bad seen in my idea. entire life. Um, so I think you're right. At some point, you just you lose that whole sense of wonder and awe, and, yeah. you, there's, and you, you run away as fast as you can. Um, but so, so my first question, or sort of a comment or, or favor, is um, we sh just share really quick a little bit with the audience about how you've been sort of able to uh, to kind of reconnect with the staff of the of the ride and how you've sort of interacted with them in the past few years. Sure. Well, um, uh, like I said, I um, there was a period, uh, probably in about 2004, where I was uh, between jobs, and <laughs> I was I've always been into giant squids, and I didn't know why, and I was looking for something on Google, and I came across an image of this ride, and just had this like. The, far and away the most intense nostalgic rush of my life. And I was like, oh, you're what screwed me up. <laughs> and so I just started collecting, like I just ravenously pulling this stuff in and I was like, oh, like no one's put this together. Like there should be a, this is my niche. This is what I can do in these two weeks. Like I'll make 20kride.com. And so I made a website where I started just pouring all of this stuff into there. And uh, eventually that attracted Bert and a couple other guys who worked on the ride. And then they brought other ones in, sent me all this memorabilia, there's interviews with them on there. And, and at the moment, the site is like woefully web 1.0. Um, I try to keep it alive and working, but uh, what, what I love is we're hitting a point now where I actually, I get like maybe two emails a week from someone who's discovered the site and just has to write to me freaking out about it. And like, 
we're getting to the point now where I get, I get more emails from kids who say, like, my dad told me about this ride and showed this to me, and it just looks so amazing, and I just think life is so unfair that I couldn't experience this. And, like, <laughs> thank you so much for, you know, there's, like, this, like, next generation thing. of And in that way, I don't think I, when I sat down, I was like, the memory of this must be kept alive. But um, it's working out that way. And so, I don't know, eventually we're talking about a Kickstarter to get it put into WordPress so it <laughs> survives. <laughs> and it's a little more easy, easier to edit, because, yeah. So, so what I've gotten out of all of this is that, uh, is that Disney can ruin people's lives. So yeah, it's a good, is that, is that right? No. <laughs> I know, I uh, do, we, do we have any, uh, any questions or, or comments from all of you for Dave? Yeah, or also anything? Quiet. He was so thorough. Don't be shy. Yes, sir. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, the, the question was, do you still have nightmares? <laughs> oh, yeah, sure. About different things, but yeah. If I'm <laughs> and if I, if I'm watching too, but underwater, I think is just and any video game that involves an underwater sequence, no matter how terrible, I'll just swim around for hours. Um, have yet to scuba dive myself. Oh, that's about that. What's will up you, with Will that? you ever get a scuba license? I think you know, with the advent of really good like anti-anxiety drugs, it's become possible probably. So I, I don't think they recommend <laughs> scuba diving while on Xanax. So I don't, I'm no, I'm no doctor. I'm not, not, not that I'm no tried. lawyer. I don't know. But, All right, uh, round of applause for Dave. Thank you. <laughs>